back to Yu-Gi-Oh! History with Joe Girlando. In today's video, we are going to April 2015 and taking a look at Necroz. Necroz has been a deck that's been on my radar for a while. I've gone back and forth as to when we should profile it and also what specific variation that we should profile. Today, I've decided to go with the Solemn Scolding variation that really tried to emphasize the power of Dijin. I think we should start looking at the Dijin lock and then eventually add some of the other variations of Necroz to the discussion. Honestly, as the format went on, I think Dijin, with Solemn Scolding specifically, became less popular, and then just utilizing the power of the Necroz themselves became the predominant strategy within the format. But to me, let's start with the Dijin Log, emphasize that at the end of the video, I'll showcase sort of the basic way of setting it up. And then over the course of however long it takes, we'll look at additional Necroz decks and some of the other powerhouses of this format. This is one of those formats that's a really exciting format because not only is there Necroz, an incredibly powerful, iconic deck. There's also other top tier decks like Shadal's and Burning Abyss, Cliff Forts and others that compete for those top spots. The Teller Knights even, I guess I could throw a fourth one in there. But today we're going to take a look at Necroz. I've modeled this deck loosely on the one that Tamid used at YCS Columbia in the summer, sort of the spring to summer of 2015, taking also into consideration some of the trends that would be apparent during the WCQ season. I've also intentionally decided to place this in April 2015, which means the April 2015 ban list is in effect. That's That put Necroz of Bryanac from 3 to 2, not that that really did much. Preparation of Rights from 3 to 1, which also didn't really do all that much. Both of those cards, although limited in some capacity, don't really change the integrity of this deck. This was one of those decks where basically every card circled itself, from Reinforcement of the Army to Bryanac to Colossus, Unicorn recycling it. Herald of the Arclight, allowing you to go into anything, Triple Manju, Triple Senju. So to me, those limitations didn't really do all that much. And this deck at its peak would be a little bit further back with three Bryonac, three Prep. But I think in terms of the actual totality of time spent playing Necroz, the idea of having one, Bri uh, one Prep and two Bryonac, I think is more representative of what that experience is really like. So we're going to take a look at what the national season was because that will also then segue really well into talking about the Burning Abyss deck that won the WCQ in North America and some of the other top strategies as well. Without further ado, let's take a deep dive look at Necroz, specifically one incorporating Solemn Scolding. All right, first we will start with the rituals. We have Necroz, Trishula. The existence of this card single-handedly warped the format, basically any format where Necroz is playable, because unlike its Synchro counterpart, you actually needed a target on the field, in the graveyard, and in your opponent's hand. And if your opponent could somehow get around that by either having no field, which in the mirror match is very common with Necroz of Valkyrius, or in decks like Burning Abyss where you could discard cards from your hand with some of your traps, Karma Cut, Phoenix Wing Blast, Mergeki Break, for example, you could actually make it so your opponent's Trishula wouldn't resolve, and it was a huge component of the mirror map trying to avoid a, resolu a resolved Trishula. It also had a secondary effect where you could discard it to stop a targeting effect, which was a pretty big deal in a format where you were trying to protect Jin when, when applicable. Then... We have three copies of Unicorn. So Unicorn's first effect on field is pretty important. When it's on field, extra deck monsters can't activate their effects, which actually shut down some of the top decks at the time, right? You put this on the field and your opponent, if their deck relied on the extra deck, which was the case in most circumstances, uh, you could actually just protect this and lock your opponent out. The other big part was that it was a level four and it combined with Kaleidoscope to allow you to send Herald of the Arc Light to the graveyard and summon this from your hand. And then the fact that it was a level four allowed you to go into Lava Chain, all huge things. Lava Chain was one of the primary ways you would actually get Dijin into the graveyard so that you could use it in a ritual summon. And then in addition to all of that, you could discard it from your hand to return a Necroz card from your graveyard uh, to your hand. So the fact that you not only got to play a level four, the fact that it synergized with Herald of Arc Light, you also used it to replenish things. You know, you could essentially search any card in your deck because this allowing you to add this back to your hand then gave you access either to any monster or any spell. So this essentially was any Necroz card. It didn't really matter its own restrictions because both of these would allow you to search whatever you needed, whether it was a spell or a monster. And if you had this in the graveyard, you could just use this to search this and then use this to search the spell that you needed. Speaking of Bryanac, we'll do that one next. We have two copies of Necroz of Bryanac. So this card allowed you to search your deck for any Necroz monster. Obviously, we'll play as many copies as possible. It kind of weirdly semi-limited to two. But that 
it didn't really affect this deck's viability. It, it didn't really affect the deck's viability at all. And then when it was actually summoned, you could bounce two cards from the extra deck back to your opponent's extra deck. So it had some utility when it was actually summoned. That didn't happen all that much, but it, it definitely was something you needed to consider. And then just to continue writing out the searchers, we have two copies of Colossus. This allows you to discard to search any Necroz spell or trap, even though that has never been printed. I will point that out. This is the card that says trap on it that everyone comments on. It, more importantly, though, is a level 3, and because it's a level 3, it allows you to combine with the Jin to put a monster on the field that has a pretty reasonable defense in 23, its sort of own minor protection effect, but then more importantly than all of that, allowing you to one-card to Jin lock your opponent with other cards. One card in the sense that it's level 3, that's what I meant by that. And then we have three copies of Valk. So Valk serves multiple purposes. One, it allows you to clear your field so that you never get Trishulid in the mirror match. And two, the fact that you can just discard it and protect yourself from a battle phase makes it so that when you pass with an empty field in the mirror match, you can actually survive. It, it kind of was this weird circumstance where both layers should just push through each other's Valks for the first few turns of the game and then eventually start planning around a universe where Valk wasn't as easy to get back. Though I will point out with the cards like Unicorn, you could recycle this quite often. So sometimes the games went really long because you would just constantly go back and forth with this battle flader like effect. But these are the Necros that I've elected to run. There are other Necros monsters that existed that all had different utility. I'll eventually profile other Necros decks, but this was sort of based on the one that uh, Tamid used at YCS Columbia during this time period. So that is our Necros, at least in terms of the rituals. We have two copies of Shurit. It is a warrior. We play three copies of Reinforcements of the Army. So although you really do want to see this card often... You didn't necessarily need to play three because you were essentially playing five with reinforcements of the army. But it allows you to get a ton of value when you tribute it off and search your deck. So it's a huge card in terms of getting to basically anything in this deck. The, the beauty of this deck is that it was so, so consistent in the sense that with these plus the Manjus and Senjus, you basically always had access to the same lines of plays. It was just kind of a matter of sequencing it so that you... You could do what you wanted in that particular game state, but the fact that you played three copies of Senju and three copies of Manju, and you got the searches off Bryanak, and you got the searches off Klaus, and you had reinforcements of the army, and sure it allowed you to search, you basically had access to all of these at any point of the game. These allowed you to recur from the graveyard. It really was a well-oiled machine, and is one of the reasons why cards like Sheer Ride was so good against the deck. In addition to just obviously being good in rituals, and again, I should point out that these allow you to search anything you want, because even if you only open Senju, Senju into... Bryanak or Colossus allows you to tutor out the spell. So even though this one in theory is a little bit more versatile, they both function in the same way in this deck because you have all of these searchers. One thing to point out is the fact is a level four is huge because when you were able to summon Manju or Senju, when you combined it with Kaleidoscope and Unicorn, you then were able to go into Herald of the Arclight to the Grave and go into Lava Chain. And that was how you actually figured out how to put Dijin on the field with Colossus. So we'll talk about Dijin in the Graveyard with Colossus as the ritual I'll show you how to do sort of the basic Dijin lock after we go through the deck, but those are our Manju slash Senjus, and then some utility cards. So I've elected to go with two copies of Max C and two copies of Effect Veil. This is exactly as Tamid did at YCS Columbia. The, the reason why these were popular is it gave you some resistance against the Dijin lock. Cards like Effect Veiler were especially good because it was one of the only ways you could stop something like Lava Chain, for example. And then obviously, if you look at this deck, you can tell that we're going to be special summoning a lot. So Max C was pretty good. It sometimes got you into a situation where your opponent would go into Valk and you would Max C and you could make it so that your opponent sort of had to allow you to draw extra cards in order to clear your field with because to avoid being Trishulid. So there was some utility there. It also, you know, if you kind of held your maxis a little bit, once the Valks were used and once some of the recycling of the Valks had been done, you know, eventually you'd get to a state where your opponent would actually have to start summoning monsters regardless of the existence of Trish. And having maxi made it so that those turns could be pretty painful. So maxi, a couple copies. It also had utility in other matchups. Decks like Zetelor Knight with Altair are going to special summon a couple times. So you could get some value in those matchups as well. Then we have the Armageddon Knight package. So I was a fan of Armageddon Knight with the Dijin. That was pretty common. I liked playing Farfa. So basically every one of these decks had an out to Dijin in the main deck. Some people liked Exiled Force. Some people liked DD Warrior Lady. Some people liked Farfa like I did. Some people also liked cards like Bullblader. They all had different, val different, different reasons. So I liked Farfa. What Farfa does is it essentially just takes the monster that was used to summon with Dijin, Colossus, and just banish it until the end phase, and then it returns, it sort of resets, and is no longer seen as a monster ritual summoned by Dijin, so it gave you a turn off. It really, it turned it off entirely, but it 
cleared out the field, and then allowed you to special summon. So you could get out of the Dujin lock there. It was a turning effect, so it was vulnerable to some of the interactions that you have, like Trishula, but it wasn't vulnerable to cards like Gunganir or Valk. If you played cards like Didi Warrior Lady, you had to worry about actually getting an attack through. Same with Bulblader. Your opponent could Valk you and make it so that your opponent just sat there with the Didi Warrior Lady and you got a turn after that. And as long as you get your own turn after Dijin, your opponent's going to lose. You know, Dijin is so powerful. If they have to pass back to you after trying to do the Didi Warrior Lady play, they're probably going to lose. And then Gunganir, although I don't have it here, it protects from destruction effects. So Exile Force was also a bit of a vulnerability there. So to me, I liked Farfa the most. It kind of worked the best, in my opinion, because it made Armageddon Knight and out to Dijin by sending Farfa. But it also allowed you to send Dijin to the graveyard when you yourself wanted to do the combo. And with three copies of Reinforcements of the Army, I, like basically everybody else, preferred a Warrior out. I, that wasn't just for this particular deck. Everybody played Warrior outs because of Reinforcements of the Army. They wanted as many Warrior outs to the Dijin lock as possible. Farfa to me was just the one that I went with. So... Another point about this one specifically is it's a little bit better against Shadal. Shadal Window can be really annoying, can't be destroyed by card effects, and if you play Exile Force, you can't Exile Force Shadal Window, whereas you can Farfa Shadal Window. So I think there's a little bit of utility there as well. So that's why I went with Farfa. I wasn't the only person to go with Farfa. That was also what Timid did, but at Nationals that year, when I played this deck, I went with Farfa. I also played a Shadal Beast, although I don't have that in this particular deck at Nationals, to give it so that Armageddon Knight not only was a monster out with Farfa, but a Spell and Trap out to give... Some resistance to Vanity's Emptiness, which was legal, although not in this particular profile, legal in the format. Those are the monsters. For the spells, we have one copy of Preparation of Rights. There's actually a time period where you could play three copies of this in the deck, and it was absolutely ridiculous. This deck was good enough even if this card never was printed. The fact that you could actually play three copies was just comical. I elected to go with a version that only had one copy after it was limited to one, because I feel like that's just a better representation of what this deck was like when it was legal. The small window of time when it's at three, I don't think it was a good representation of what this deck was really like. Uh, two copies of Forbidden Lands. This gives you some outs to the cards like Book of Moon or even Book of Eclipse that can set your Dijin face down, which resets, or sorry, <laughs> your Colossus, which resets the Dijin effect. So a couple copies of Forbidden Lands. Then we have, it's also good, just before I move on, it's good against some of the cards in Burning Abyss 2. If they target your monsters, obviously being able to do this when they try to Karma Cut, when they have to target a monster, or Regeki Break and Wing Blast, where they're probably going to target a monster, it allows you to make some pushes into those matchups as well. And then decks like Satellar Knight tend to play a lot of trap cards, so sometimes you could hit this on, you know, whether it's Bottomless or a card like that. It's not a bad card in a format where you're going to expect some things that aren't just mirror matches. And then we have two copies of each of the rituals. So this was pretty typical. Most people play just two, 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 and two. It has a recursion, sort of allowing you to cycle through your deck in the graveyard effect. Besides the fact that it all shared that component, they all sort of did something a little bit different. So Necro's Mirror allowed you to summon from your hand by banishing from the graveyard. Kaleidoscope allowed you to summon from your hand by using your extra deck, which was enormous because there was cards like Herald of the Arclight that gave you some value. <laughs> the fact that that card could actually just search rituals is wild. That unique synergy, but allowed you to use your extra deck. And then Cycle allowed you to special summon from your grave by using your hand. Uh, this one was really great when you had Shurit in your hand. You know, this deck could generate a ton of card advantage by just doing interactions like Necros Cycle, special summon Trishula from the graveyard, discard Shurit from hand, and if the Trishula is resolving, which presumably is the reason you're summoning it, you just get tons of advantage. And you know, Shuret on, on Valkyrius and so many different things you'd get generate card advantage. They all served a little bit of a different purpose in terms of how the deck functioned. Usually early you in Kaleidoscope because if you could combine it with Unicorn, that's how you go into Lava Chain. Then as I mentioned, we have three copies of Reinforcements of the Army. You have the Armageddon Knight that allows you to go into Dijin or Farfa as an out to Dijin or as a way to get your own Dijin on the field. Then you had Colossus and Shuret as additional cards to search. So three copies of Rhoda. It is an old card, not limited to once per turn, so we'll happily play three copies. And then I elected to go with three copies of Solemn Scolding. So Solemn Scolding, if it's the only card that you have set, it's essentially a Solemn Judgment for 3,000 life points. Uh, this card, when set with Dijin, made it really difficult to out because in addition to having this that negates any singular effect, the cards like Valk and Trishula gave you additional ways of counterplaying to some of the Dijin outs. And when you had this set, your opponent really needed like three or four Dijin outs to really get through that. And that simply just wasn't realistic. So three copies of Solemn Scolding. This deck obviously wants to go first because of a card like this. Not all of the Necroz decks played this. I've decided to go and start with the Scolding version first. I'll eventually profile decks that just didn't even play any traps. If they did play a trap, so it was something like Emptiness. But we'll start here. 
I played Scolding at National, so that's why I've decided to go with this particular deck first. I don't necessarily think, in retrospect, that it was the best version of Necros, because it's a little bit more all-in than maybe you needed to be. The deck was powerful enough without going all-in on a card like this, but this, with the Dijin Lock, tough to beat. All right, in terms of the extra deck, we have two copies of Herald of the Arc Light. The level four is enormous because it combines with Kaleidoscope and Unicorn, allowing you to search your deck as well. That's integral in the actual Dijin Lock, which I'll talk about in a little bit. I'll also jump to any level 12. It could be Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon. I elected to go with this cool Dragon Master Knight. Uh, before Konami was a little bit more strict about this, this was one of the cards in my calculator case. It literally was there for 20 years almost. But Dragon Master Knight, it's in Japanese. That's why it was in my calculator case. That's not allowed anymore, but... Any level 12 works, you're not going to summon it. The only reason you have it is when you need to go Kaleidoscope into some of the unusual sequences. So a level 8 and a level 4, for example, could be done with this. That's also why you play Star Reader. So that if you need to go a level 3 and a, a level 8 and a level 3, right? So to go into, for example, this is the level 3 that you're always going into. But if you wanted to go into Valk, right, this would equal level 11. So that's why you play Star Reader. Whereas this would equal level 12, which is why you also needed any level 12. And it didn't need to be Star Raider, just anything at all in the game that were these levels in order to make those special summons off of Kaleidoscope. In terms of the actual monsters that you're going to summon, they're all going to be seed monsters. But we have Lava Chain, integral to the combo of actually getting the Dijin Lock on. At this period of time, there was a bunch of just really good rank 4 monsters, so Silent Honor Arc. Excite on Knights, Cowboy, Abyss Dweller was really good against Shadals, uh, Karen Gorgon, which was pretty good. If you could summon this in addition to Dijin, it was nuts because a lot of the outs that your opponent would have, you can just stop with this. Uh, Castell, just a utility card. Emerald, because the game sometimes can go long and it's just a great card in general. Diamond Direwolf, just the epitome of utility. Uh, Rhapsody and Berserk, which was pretty good. It could pick off cards in your opponent's graveyard in the mirror match, which if the game went long was pretty big. Not everybody played some of the Necroz monsters that allowed you to recycle from the banished pile. So having a card like that was pretty good. You could elect to play Giant Hand. It was a prize card, so it was you know, relatively expensive in the grand scheme of things. If you don't want to play a prize card and want to go back and play the format, uh, Ragna Zero is a card that you'd see sometimes. There were other ones as well. It wasn't just this. Some people actually played two Rhapsody and Berserk. You know, the 15 spot's kind of a flex spot, so you can put you know, whatever you feel is necessary in that spot. I, I elected to give you the options here. This is 16 is currently constituted. The next thing we'll talk about really quick are the decks at the time. This is a format that we've yet to profile, so this might be news to some. And then we'll talk a little bit about the side deck that I put together. We have Burning Abyss, of course, one of the top decks, won Nationals that year. We have Sayteller Knight, not that great of a deck, but definitely a deck you could sometimes encounter. We had Shadals. Uh, sometimes they played the Star Seraphs, an engine that I absolutely loved <laughs> back in the day. So I'll put that down too. This will also be there for the Shadals. I actually don't own any cards that are literally Cliffward cards. I'll have to get them before profiling it, but we'll use Summoner, Summoner's Art to represent the Cliffward strategy. And then we have these to represent the Mirror Match. These are some of the Necroz monsters that I have not included in this deck. I play Gunganir at Nationals because of its protection effect. Being able to discard it when your opponent tries to destroy the Dijin Lock is, is great. And then... Decisive Arms have it has its own utility. It destroys set cards and it's basically an honest-like effect. And then Catastrophe is one of the we we weaker ones. But these are much more common. This one you almost never saw. But these are some of the Necroz cards that you would also see during the format. I'll profile Necroz again with some of these included. I'll intentionally make sure I pick a deck list that has at least those two in it. But these are some of the decks that you could, in could see during the format. So we have a couple of copies of Tsukiyomi. Tsukiyomi was pretty good against Windup. Uh, technically, it is a Dijin out too. Yeah. The second, rather the third and fourth copies of Effect Failure and Max C, and then two copies of Lancia. In the mirror match, it was often better to go second, and in doing so, you'd get the extra card. You risked your opponent Dijin locking you and you having no outs to it, so you sort of needed the side to stop that from happening, which is where these come in. At least the effect, I mean, Max C, your opponent can Dijin lock you, but if they Dijin lock you under Max C, you're going to draw a bunch of cards, and they're probably not going to do that, considering how many outs people often have in their deck. And then in doing so, uh, you'd be able to stymie them just with Max C. So this doesn't feel like a Dijin out, but it sort of is a Dijin out. And then Lancia is a Dijin out, because you're going to need to be able to banish in order to actually use Dijin, so this card allows you to stop that from happening. And then we have... Three copies of Shared Ride. I was kind of on the fence about putting this in here. 
A lot of people played Shared Ride during this time period, but I think it was better often just to go second in the mirror match. This is kind of one of those weird cards where you might put it in against an opponent who you think is going to go second, so you put it in going first when you think your opponent's going to make you go first. And it's a decent hedge, because even if they go first, it's not the worst card in the world, but in this deck, <laughs> obviously you're going to be searching a ton. Reinforcements of the Army, Shuret, Bryanna, Colossus... You name it, being able to draw one card every time your opponent searches and more or less shut them down is huge, particularly if you have a bunch of hand traps like this and cards like Valk, which are pseudo copies of something like Battle Fader. And then for the trap decks, which there were a few of, Cliff Forts was one, and then in addition to that, say Teller Knight, and even Burning Abyss was quite a bit of a trap deck. We have three copies of MST and three copies of Royal Decree. Uh, one card I considered including, which a lot of people did, was Danko Seca. I decided I'm going to use Danko Seca in another deck list for this particular format. I'm going to go with the Decree and MST package, which I think was representative of some of the deck lists at the time, equally as much as that. All right, for those of you who are not playing during the format, let's talk about the Dijin Lock and how you go about doing it. So you needed Manju, and then essentially any of these cards would be sufficient in order to pull it off. The Reinforcements of the Army would allow you to search Colossus, so that's why that would work as a combo piece. Prep would allow you to search Brian Act, which can search any of these, which is why it's a combo piece. Just drawing this outright is sufficient, drawing this outright is sufficient, and then this can search either of these. And essentially what you would do is if you drew this and any of these cards, I can even shuffle it up and it doesn't matter which one I draw, they all will do the same thing. Let's say I opened Unicorn. Okay. I would summon Manju and I would search my deck for Brian Act. Brian Act would discard to search Colossus, and then that would search for kaleidoscope so now i've got kaleidoscope unicorn this is essentially this point that you needed colossus engrave with kaleido unicorn and a level four in the field typically manju would be the level four but then you could go activate kaleidoscope to summon unicorn sending herald of the arc light to the graveyard that would then allow you to trigger herald of the arc light and you would search your deck for a copy of necroz cycle from there, you would overlay these two into Lava Chain. Lava Chain would then allow you to detach in order to put Dijin into the graveyard. So you only needed the one copy of Dijin. Then you would activate Cycle. Now, typically with Cycle, the way it works is you summon from the graveyard by tributing from your hand, but Dijin has a secondary, well, its own, I guess, main effect, but allows you to banish it from the graveyard whenever you're doing a ritual. And if, as long as the levels line up, which three and three happen to line up perfectly, you can just use it. So in this case, although you're summoning from the graveyard, the Necroz, and typically you would be using your hand to make that play, you don't need to do that. You can just banish the Dijin. And now you have a live Colossus under Dijin. Your opponent cannot special summon. Very difficult to beat a 2300 monster without special summoning. Yeah, there are cards. You know, Exile Force, DD Warrior Lady can out this. However, as I mentioned before, we are playing a card such as Solemn Scolding to make it so that it's especially difficult because now your opponent needs to use their normal summon on one of those, unsuccessfully out to the Dijin Lock, and you have cards like Valk, which can stop battle phases. You have cards like, in this particular version, Trishula, that can stop targeting effects, and in other versions, like Gunganir could be incorporated to out cards that out Colossus, like Rageki, which was legal during this format and also pretty popular. So this is sort of the essence of the Dijin Lock. I know this wasn't included in the deck list, but the deck actually had in archetype, totally viable, two cards you guaranteed play, and one that was actually relatively popular, outs to the outs to the Dijin Lock. So that is the essence of what this deck was trying to do. It allowed you to basically play an entire Necroz deck, and sometimes you just didn't go for the Dijin Lock, but sometimes you open Scolding, and this was just a auto win. But nevertheless, that's Joe Lander for Yu-Gi-Oh! History. Thank you for watching. Check back soon for plenty more Yu-Gi-Oh! content.